everyone, this is the second lecture for week one of Introduction to Sociological Theory. And in this lecture, I'll be talking a little bit about Eurocentrism and Androcentrism, specifically in sociological theory and its canon. So the history of sociology is typically told as the history of its theorists and their theories. And this history is usually told as a history of the founding generation of men writing in the middle of the 19th century, and then a second classic generation of men who wrote between 1890 and 1930. This account of the development of sociology would have us believe that it was only Western and later North American white men who played a part in its emergence. And this history is often presented as an account of the natural way that sociology occurred. In contrast, the authors of your main textbook, The Women Founders, argued that this history is a social construction that arose out of the discipline's power arrangements. So like all histories, the development of sociology reflects an ongoing conflict between exclusionary and inclusionary values and practices. Eurocentrism can be understood as a more specific phenomenon within ethnocentrism, and ethnocentrism refers to the regard of one's own ethnic group or society as superior to others, where other groups are assessed and judged in terms of the categories and standards of evaluation of one's own group. Eurocentrism is defined as a thought style in which the assessment and evaluation of non-European societies is couched in terms of the cultural assumptions and biases of Europeans and by extension the West. Eurocentrism is a way of seeing the world that's focused on Western European lives, intellect, contributions, and lived experiences. Although Eurocentrism originates in Europe, as a thought style, it's not confined to Europeans or those in the West, as it ex exists in many non-Western societies. In the social sciences, mainstream discourse describes the origins of social and scientific thought as coming from the Western societies, and this discourse exists not just in Western cultures and classrooms, but in non-Western societies as well. Social sciences are typically defined as Western disciplines, and the rise of sociological theory is discussed in the context of the rise of sociological theories in Europe. Non-Western founders of social thought and social science are usually left out of core syllabi. In most sociological theory textbooks or works on the history of social thought and theory, Europeans are the knowing subjects or the social theorists and social thinkers, and to the extent that non-Europeans figure in these accounts, they are objects of the observations and analyses of the European theorists, such as the Indians and Algerians in Marx's writings, or Turks, Chinese, and Jews in Weber's works. The impression that this gives is that there were no thinkers in Asia and Africa contemporaneous with Europeans such as Marx, Weber, and Durkheim. The authors of Beyond the Canon also argue that the implementation of European social sciences into non-European countries has resulted in a greater consumption of imported theories rather than original theorizing in non-Western societies today. One of the earliest thinkers to critique Eurocentric perspectives was Jose Rizal, who attempted revisions of Filipino history from a Filipino point of view. One of the first sociologists to critique the dominance of Eurocentric constructions was Benoit Kumar Sarkar, who wrote against the prevailing study of Indian history of his time, noting its one-sided emphasis on the idealistic and mystical aspects of Hinduism. The traits of Eurocentrism as they're manifested in sociology and other social sciences include, first, the subject-object dichotomy, second, the prominence of Europeans, Third, the view of Europeans as originators. Fourth, the imposition of European categories and concepts. And fifth, the view of the objective superiority of European civilization. The subject-object dichotomy is represented as Europeans being the knowing subjects, while non-Europeans remain as unheard objects whose standpoints are conveyed only through the agency of Europeans. Non-Europeans are considered to be passive, non-autonomous, and non-sovereign, and this omniscience of the Europeans resulted in problematic constructions of non-European or quote-unquote oriental history and society. These constructions had come under attack by the members of those societies at three levels. They don't fit empirical reality, they over-abstract, resulting in the erasure of variety, and they are founded on European prejudices. 
Europeans are also foregrounded or given prominence, resulting in the distortion of the role of non-Europeans. For example, modernity is seen as a specifically European creation, and encounters with non-Europeans are not viewed as having brought about significant changes relevant to the emergence of modern society. Europeans are generally seen as originators of modern civilization, where in reality there should be greater consideration of its multicultural origins. In texts, Muslim philosophers are often seen as having simply transmitted Greek thought to the European world of the Renaissance. Alfred Weber, the youngest brother of Max Weber, an author of A History of Philosophy, notes that the Arabs were apt pupils of the Greeks, Persians, and Hindus in science. Their philosophy is more learned than the original and consists mainly of exegesis, particularly of the exegesis of Aristotle's system. To the extent that the process of modernization in Europe was universal and replicable elsewhere, so too were the social sciences that explain modernization. Non-European societies are regarded as worthy subjects of analysis, but rarely as sources of concepts and ideas. A.L. Tibawi, a Palestinian Arab historian, brought attention to the persistence in studying Islam and the Arabs through the application of Western European categories. Finally, modern civilization as modernity is a European creation and is due to European superiority, whether this is viewed in biological, cultural, or sociological terms. Moving on to androcentrism, which can be defined as a way of seeing the world that is focused on male ideas, values, and contributions. The recorded history of sociology and sociological theory is steeped in androcentrism in the sense that it remembers, lists, records, and reproduces contributions by male scholars. Although women social theorists were present before the birth of the formalized discipline of sociology, and several others were present for and contributed to its emergence, They've been routinely left out and remain unmentioned in standard narratives of sociology's history. The authors of The Women Founders claim that women have not been invisible in the development of sociology, but that they were written out. The authors of The Women Founders argue that women sociologists were invisible at the time that the discipline was founded, but that they were written out of the sociological canon. Being written out of history suggests that you were once seen as an important member of a community, but then were erased from its record. There are four main reasons why the women founders we'll discuss in this class were erased rather than invisible according to the text. First, almost all of the women were well-known public figures in their lifetime, even larger than the budding field of sociology that they helped create. Like Marx, Weber, and Durkheim, their work had relevance for all social sciences and not just sociology. Second, they created social theory and did sociology in the same places and at the same time as the male founders. Many of the women founders were publishing articles at the same time or before many of the male founders. Third, they were widely recognized by their contemporaries, including male sociologists, as significant social analysts. And fourth, they all acted as members of a sociological community, meeting at least one of the following criteria employment as a sociologist, membership in a national sociological association, publications framed by explicit concern with sociological principles, self-identification as a sociologist, and recognition by contemporaries as a sociologist. They also knew each other and each other's work. Gilman, Weber, and Wells Barnett visited Hull House, which was the working base for Adams and most of the Chicago women. Adams published with Wells Barnett on lynching, in Adams, Wells Barnett, Kelly, and Breckenridge participated in the founding of the NAACP. The authors of The Women Founders argue that women's erasure from sociology's record is an issue of authority, specifically the denial of authority. They define authority as a form of power that is a distinctive capacity to get things done in words, and they argue that authority factored into two types of politics a politics of gender and a politics of knowledge that determined the women's legacy. The text argues that the erasure of the women founders can be understood by how they were known by others. This idea is influenced by phenomenological theory, which we won't get into too much in depth here, mainly the concept of typifications or mental constructs. 
When an individual is not physically present in another person's consciousness, they are known through typifications. When a person dies and becomes a predecessor, typifications become even more important. Gender factors into this because when these women died, they became fully subsumed under the assumptions of the patriarchy. When they were alive, the women founders were active in the construction of the discipline. While they lacked the authority that the men had while they were alive, once they died and were no longer in that physical presence, their authority lessened even more. The marginalization of the women founders produced by the politics of gender was accelerated by the debate over the purpose of sociology and the social role of the sociologist. Between 1890 and 1947, sociology's academic elites decided that the appropriate role for the sociologist was that of the intellectual committed to scientific rigor, value neutrality, and formal abstraction. This consensus delegitimized the work of the women founders and many men who practiced the alternative position of a critical activist sociology of advocacy. In 1895, for example, the lead article in the first issue of the American Journal of Sociology seemed to recognize both sides, stating that the purpose of sociology was to increase people's understandings so that they can form more effective combinations for the promotion of the general welfare. But by 1916, the same author spoke to a decades-long move in academic sociology, away from social reform and towards pure research and academic recognition. Sociology's academic reputation was now seen as depending on scientific rigor. He explained whether sociologists retain the academic recognition they have will depend on whether they turn out to be at least as scientific as the most responsible of their colleagues. In the 1921 book, Introduction to the Science of Sociology, sociology was described as a fundamental science, not mere collections of social welfare programs and practices. Sociology is the abstract science of human experience and human nature. And by 1947, the then editor of American Journal of Sociology dismissed many early sociologists as social workers, social reformers, social prophets, and social critics who, for want of any other academic refuge, had identified themselves with the adolescent science of sociology. The most common work sites of sociologists in the 1890s were social service organizations, labor organizations, research and policymaking groups, settlement houses, politics, and religion. In these positions, women were employed alongside men, but when academia became the primary work site for sociologists, women no longer interacted with men as professional equals. Between 1890 and 1940, across all disciplines, women made up about one quarter of the faculty, but they were often occupied in women's disciplines, like home economics and library science, and held non-tenured, low-rank, and low-paying jobs. During this time, no woman held senior rank in any of the leading sociology departments, no woman served as president of the American Sociological Society, and articles by women published in the leading journals constituted less than 10% of all published papers. By the mid-1930s, sociology had undergone a significant change, which marginalized many male thinkers and erased the women founders. Functionalist theory and survey research developed by Talcott Parsons and Robert Merton laid the groundwork for a formal, value-neutral, universalized theory and methodology for the study of society. Functionalism argues that all societal dynamics can be understood by explaining their functions in society. For example, Parsons argued that everything that exists in society exists for a reason, to fulfill a specific function. Although he accounted for dysfunctions, which were things in society that were not serving their intended purpose, Parsons had been heavily criticized by conflict theorists for ignoring the power structures that exist in society. Instead of a mutual consensual agreement about how society will be arranged, conflict theorists argue that unequal power arrangements allow some individuals to make the decisions about how society is structured. In contrast, Parsons believed that our actions reflected our values or the values of people around us and highlighted individual agency in his theories of society. The authors of The Women Founders and Sociology Beyond the Canon 
argued that there are two important points to be made about the politics of knowledge and sociology's development as a discipline. First, the modern sociological canon is a social construction, not a natural development. So there's no true sociological canon, but rather many potential ways of telling the history of the discipline that differ based on power arrangements at the time and today. Second, the configuration of modern sociological canon legitimizes a type of sociology that exists only because of the marginalization of the women and non-European founders. Social consensus over social inequality, detached analysis over activist engagement, and theoretical abstraction over critique came to represent sociology only through the erasure of earlier definitions put forth largely by the women and non-European founders of the discipline.